Hello friends, I welcome you to tonight's edition of Sleep Story. Tonight I shall be reading for you three stories by Beatrix Potter. The Tale of Tom Kitten, The Tale of Samuel Whiskers, or The Roly Poly Pudding, and The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin. Before we begin these stories, find yourself a place where you can relax, unwind, take a deep breath. As you exhale, you can feel your body relax. Your day is done, there's nothing else that matters now, but to listen to these stories and get ready for sleep. And so, let us begin these stories. The Tale of Tom Kitten Once upon a time, there were three little kittens, and their names were Mittens, Tom Kitten, and Moppet. They had dear little fur coats of their own, and they tumbled about the doorstep and played in the dust. But one day their mother, Mrs. Tabitha Twitchett, expected friends to tea, so she fetched the kittens indoors to wash and dress them before the fine company arrived. First she scrubbed their faces, and this one is Muppet. Then she brushed their fur, this one is Mittens. Then she combed the tails and whiskers. This is Tom Kitten. Tom was very naughty, and he scratched. Mrs. Tabitha dressed Moppet and Mittens in clean pinafores and tuckers, and then she took all sorts of elegant, uncomfortable clothes out of a chest of drawers in order to dress up her son Thomas. Tom Kitten was very fat, and he had grown. Several buttons burst off. His mother sewed them on again. When the three kittens were ready, Mrs. Tabitha unwisely turned them out into the garden, to be out of the way while she made hot buttered toast. Now keep your frocks clean, children. You must walk on your hind legs. Keep away from the dirty ash pit and from Sally Henny Penny, and from the pigsty and the puddle ducks. Moppet and Mittens walked down the garden path unsteadily. Presently they trod upon their pinafores and fell onto their noses. And when they stood up, there were several green smears. Let us climb up the rockery and sit on the garden wall, said Moppet. They turned the pinafores back to front, and went up with a skip and a jump. Moppet's white tucker fell down into the road. Tom Kitten was quite unable to jump when walking upon his hind legs in trousers. He came up the rockery by degrees, breaking the ferns, and shedding buttons right and left. He was all in pieces when he reached the top of the wall. Moppet and Mittens tried to pull him together. His hat fell off, and the rest of his buttons burst. While they were in difficulties, there was a pit-pat, paddle-pat, and the three puddle-ducks came along the hard high road, marching one behind the other and doing the goose step, pit-pat, paddle-pat, pit-pat, waddle-pat. They stopped and stood in a row, and stared up at the kittens. They had very small eyes and looked surprised. Then the two duck birds, Rebecca and Jim Mima Puddle Duck, picked up the hat and tucker and put them on. Mittens laughed so that she fell off the wall. 
Moppet and Tom descended after her. The pinafores and all the rest of Tom's clothes came off on the way down. Come, Mr. Drake Puddle Duck, said Moppet. Come and help us to dress him. Come and button up Tom. Mr. Drake Puddle Duck advanced in a slow, sideways manner and picked up the various articles. But he put them on himself, and they fitted him even worse than Tom Kitten. It's a very fine morning, said Mr. Drake Puddle Duck. And he and Jemima and Rebecca Puddle Duck set off up the road, keeping step, pit pat, paddle pat, pit pat, waddle pat. Then Tabitha Twitchit came down the garden and found her kittens on the wall with no clothes on. She pulled them off the wall, smacked them, and took them back to the house. My friends will arrive in a minute, and you are not fit to be seen. I am affronted, said Mrs. Tabitha Twitchit. She sent them upstairs, and I am sorry to say she told her friends that they were in bed with the measles, which was not true. Quite the contrary, they were not in bed, not in the least. Somehow they were very extraordinary noises overhead, which disturbed the dignity and repose of the tea party. And I think that some day I shall have to make another, larger book to tell you more about Tom Kitten. As for the puddle ducks, they went into a pond. The clothes all came off directly, because there were no buttons. And Mr. Drake Puddle Duck and Jemima and Rebecca have been looking for them ever since. The Tale of Samuel Whiskers or The Roly Poly Pudding once upon a time, there was an old cat, called Mrs. Tabitha Twitchit, who was an anxious parent. She used to lose her kittens continually, and whenever they were lost, they were always in mischief. On baking day, she determined to shut them up in a cupboard. She caught Moppet and Mittens, but she could not find Tom. Mrs. Tabitha went up and down all over the house, mewing for a Tom Kitten. She looked in the pantry under the staircase. And she searched the best spare bedroom that was all covered up with dust sheets. She went right upstairs and looked into the attics but she could not find him anywhere. It was an old, old house, full of cupboards and passages. Some of the walls were four feet thick, and there used to be queer noises inside them, as if there might be a little secret staircase. Certainly there were odd little jagged doorways in the wainscot, and things disappeared at night, especially cheese and bacon. Mrs. Tabitha became more and more distracted and mute dreadfully. While their mother was searching the house, Moppet and Mittens had got into mischief. The cupboard door was not locked, so they pushed it open and came out. They went straight to the dough, which was set to rise in a pan before the fire. They patted it with their little soft paws. Shall we make dear little muffins? said Mittens to Moppet. But just at that moment somebody knocked at the front door, and Moppet jumped into the flour barrel in a fright. Mittens ran away to the dairy, and hid in an empty jar on the stone shelf where the milk pans stand. The visitor was a neighbor, Mrs. Ribby. She had called to borrow some yeast. 
Mrs. Tabitha came downstairs, mewing dreadfully. Come in, Cousin Ribby, come in, and sit ye down. I am in sad trouble, Cousin Ribby, said Tabitha, shedding tears. I've lost my dear son Thomas. I'm afraid the rats have got him. She wiped her eyes with her apron. He's a bad kitten, Cousin Tabitha. He made the cat's cradle of my best bonnet last time I came to tea. Where have you looked for him? All over the house. The rats are too many for me. What a thing it is to have an unruly family, said Mrs. Tabitha Twitchit. I'm not afraid of rats. I will help you to find him, and whip him too. What is all that soot in the fender? And the chimney wants sweeping. Oh, dear me, Cousin Ribby, now Moppet and Mittens are gone. They have both got out of the cupboard. Ribby and Tabitha set to work to search the house thoroughly again. They poked under the beds with Ribby's umbrella, and they rummaged in cupboards. They even fetched a candle and looked inside the clothes chest in one of the attics. They could not find anything, but once they heard a door bang, and somebody scudded downstairs. Yes, it is infested with rats, said Tabitha tearfully. I caught seven young ones out of one hole in the back kitchen. And we had them for dinner last Saturday, and once I saw the old father rat, an enormous old rat, Cousin Ribby. I was just going to chomp upon him when he showed his yellow teeth at me and whisked down the hole. The rats get upon my nerves, Cousin Ribby, said Tabitha. Ribby and Tabitha searched and searched. They both heard a curious roly-poly noise under the attic floor. But there was nothing to be seen. They returned to the kitchen. Here's one of your kittens at least, said Ribby, dragging Moppet out of the flower barrel. They shook the flower off her and set her down on the kitchen floor. She seemed to be in a terrible fright. Oh, mother, mother, said Moppet, there's been an old woman rat in the kitchen, and she's stolen some of the dough. The two cats ran to look at the dough pan. Sure enough, there were marks of little scratching fingers, and a lump of dough was gone. Which way did she go, Moppet? But Moppet had been too much frightened to peep out of the barrel again. Ribby and Tabitha took her with them to keep her safely in sight, while they went on with their search. They went into the dairy. The first thing they found was mittens, hiding in an empty jar. They tipped up the jar, and she scrambled out. Oh, mother, mother, said Mittens. Oh, mother, mother, there has been an old man rat in the dairy. A dreadful, enormous big rat, mother, and he's stolen a pat of butter and the rolling pin. Ribby and Tabitha looked at one another. A rolling pin and butter? Oh, my poor son Thomas! exclaimed Tabitha, wringing her paws. A rolling pin, said Ribby. Did we not hear a roly-poly noise in the attic when we were looking into that chest? Ribby and Tabitha rushed upstairs again. Sure enough, the roly-poly noise was still going on, quite distinctly, under the attic floor. This is serious, Cousin Tabitha, said Ribby. We must send for John Joyner at once, with a saw. Now, this is what had been happening to Tom Kitten, and it shows how very unwise it is to go up a chimney 
in a very old house, where a person does not know his way, and where there are enormous rats. Tom Kitten did not want to be shut up in a cupboard. When he saw that his mother was going to bake, he determined to hide. He looked about for a nice convenient place, and he fixed upon the chimney. The fire had only just been lighted, and it was not hot. But there was a white choky smoke from the green sticks. Tom Kitten got upon the fender and looked up. It was a big, old-fashioned fireplace. The chimney itself was wide enough inside for a man to stand up and walk about. So there was plenty of room for a little Tom Cat. He jumped right up into the fireplace, balancing himself upon the iron bar where the kettle hangs. Tom Kitten took another big jump off the bar and landed on a ledge high up inside the chimney, knocking down some soot into the fender. Tom Kitten coughed and choked with the smoke, and he could hear the sticks beginning to crackle and burn in the fireplace down below. He made up his mind to climb right to the top and get out on the slates and try to catch sparrows. I cannot go back. If I slip, I might fall in the fire and singe my beautiful tail and my little blue jacket. The chimney was a very big, old-fashioned one. It was built in the days when people burnt logs of wood upon the hearth. The chimney stack stood up upon the roof like a little stone tower and the daylight shone down from the top, under the slanting slates that kept out the rain. Tom Kitten was getting very frightened. He climbed up and up and up. Then he waded sideways through inches of soot. He was like a little sweep himself. It was most confusing in the dark. One flue seemed to lead into another, there was less smoke, but Tom Kitten felt quite lost. He scrambled up and up, but before he reached the chimney top, he came to a place where somebody had loosened a stone in the wall. There were some mutton bones lying about. This seems funny, said Tom Kitten. Who has been gnawing bones up here in the chimney? I wish I had never come. And what a funny smell. It is something like a mouse, only dreadfully strong. It makes me sneeze, said Tom Kitten. He squeezed through the hole in the wall and dragged himself along a most uncomfortably tight passage where there was scarcely any light. He groped his way carefully for several yards. He was at the back of the skirting board in the attic where there is a little mark in the picture. All at once he fell head over heels in the dark, down a hole, and landed on a heap of very dirty rags. When Tom Kitten picked himself up and looked about him, he found himself in a place that he had never seen before, although he had lived all his life in the house. It was a very small, stuffy, fusty room, with boards and rafters and cobwebs and glass and plaster. Opposite to him, as far away as he could sit, was an enormous rat. What do you mean by tumbling into my bed? All covered with smuts, said the rat, chattering his teeth. Please, sir, the chimney wants sweeping, said poor Tom Kitten. Anna Maria, Anna Maria, squeaked the rat. There was a pattering noise, and an old woman rat poked her head round a rafter. All in a minute she rushed upon Tom Kitten, and before he knew what was happening, his coat was pulled off, and he was rolled up in a bundle and tied with string 
in very hard knots. Anna Maria did the tying. The old rat watched her and took snuff. When she had finished, they both sat staring at him with their mouths open. Anna Maria, said the old man rat, whose name was Samuel Whiskers. Anna Maria, make me a kitten dumpling roly-poly pudding for my dinner. It requires dough and a pat of butter and a rolling pin, said Anna Maria, considering Tom Kitten with her head on one side. No, said Samuel Whiskers. Make it properly, Anna Maria, with breadcrumbs. Nonsense, butter and dough, replied Anna Maria. The two rats consulted together for a few minutes, and then went away. Samuel Whiskers got through a hole in the wainscot, and went boldly down the front staircase to the dairy to get the butter. He did not meet anybody. He made a second journey for the rolling pin. He pushed it in front of him with his paws, like a brewer's man trundling a barrel. He could hear Ribby and Tabitha talking, but they were busy lighting the candle to look into the chest. They did not see him. Anna Maria went down by way of the skirting board and a window shutter to the kitchen to steal the dough. She borrowed a small saucer and scooped up the dough with her paws. She did not observe Moppet. While Tom Kitten was left alone under the floor of the attic, he wriggled about and tried to mew for help. But his mouth was full of soot and cobwebs, and he was tied up in such very tight knots he could not make anybody hear him. Except a spider, which came out of a crack in the ceiling and examined the knots critically, from a safe distance. It was a judge of knots, because it had a habit of tying up unfortunate blue bottles. It did not offer to assist him. Tom Kitten wriggled and squirmed until he was quite exhausted. Presently the rats came back and set to work to make him into a dumpling. First they smeared him with butter, and then they rolled him in the dough. Will not the string be very indigestible, Anna Maria? inquired Samuel Whiskers. Anna Maria said she thought that it was of no consequence, but she wished that Tom Kitten would hold his head still as it disarranged the pastry. She laid hold of his ears. Tom Kitten bit and spat, and mewed and wriggled, and the rolling pin went roly-poly, roly, roly, poly, roly. The rats each held an end. His tail is sticking out. You did not fetch enough dough, Anna Maria. I fetched as much as I could carry, replied Anna Maria. I do not think, said Samuel Whiskers, pausing to take a look at Tom Kitten, I do not think it will be a good pudding. It smells sooty. Anna Maria was about to argue the point, when all at once there began to be other sounds up above. The rasping noise of a saw and the noise of a little dog, scratching and yelping. The rats dropped the rolling pin and listened attentively. We are discovered and interrupted, Anna Maria. Let us collect our property and other people's, and depart at once. I fear that we shall be obliged to leave this pudding. But I am persuaded that the nuts would have proved indigestible, whatever you may urge to the contrary. Come away at once and help me tie up some mutton bones in a counterpane, said Anna Maria. I've got half a smoked ham hidden in the chimney. 
So it happened that by the time John Joyner had got the plank up, there was nobody under the floor except a rolling pin and Tom Kitten in a very dirty dumpling. But there was a strong smell of rats, and John Joyner spent the rest of the morning sniffing and whining and wagging his tail and going round and round with his head in the hole like a gimlet. Then he kneeled the plank down again and put his tools in his bag and came downstairs. The cat family had quite recovered. They invited him to stay to dinner. The dumpling had been peeled off Tom Kitten and made separately into a bag pudding with currants in it to hide the smuts. They had been obliged to put Tom Kitten into a hot bath to get the butter off. John Joyner smelled the pudding, but he regretted that he had not time to stay to dinner, because he had just finished making a wheelbarrow for Miss Potter, and she had ordered two handcoops. And when I was going to the post late in the afternoon, I looked up the lane from the corner, and I saw Mr. Samuel Whiskers and his wife on the run, with big bundles on a little wheelbarrow which looked very like mine. They were just turning in at the gate to the barn of Farmer Potatoes. Samuel Whiskers was puffing and out of breath. Anna Maria was still arguing in shrill tones. She seemed to know her way, and she seemed to have a quantity of luggage. I am sure I never gave her leave to borrow my wheelbarrow. They went into the barn and hauled the parcels with a bit of string to the top of the haymow. After that, there were no more rats for a long time at Tabitha Twitchett's. As for Farmer Potatoes, he has been driven nearly distracted. There are rats and rats and rats in his barn. They eat up the chicken food and steal the oats and bran, and make holes in the meal bags, and they are all descendants from Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Whiskers, children and grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. There is no end to them. Moppet and Mittens have grown up into very good rat-catchers. They go out rat-catching in the village, and they find plenty of employment. They charge so much a dozen, and earn their living very comfortably. They hang up the rat's tails in a row on the barn door, to show how many they have caught, dozens and dozens of them. But Tom Kitten has always been afraid of a rat. He never durst face anything that is bigger than a mouse. The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin This is a tale about a tail, a tail that belonged to a little red squirrel, and his name was Nutkin. He had a brother called Twinkleberry, and a great many cousins. They lived in a wood at the edge of a lake. In the middle of the lake there is an island covered with trees and nut bushes, and amongst those trees stands a hollow oak tree, which is the house of an owl who is called Old Brown. One autumn, when the nuts were ripe, and the leaves on the hazel bushes were golden and green, Nutkin and Twinkleberry, and all the other little squirrels, came out of the wood and down to the edge of the lake. They made little rafts out of twigs, and they paddled away over the water to Owl Island to gather nuts. Each squirrel had a little sack and a large oar, and spread out his tail for a sail. They also took with them an offering of three fat mice as a present for Old Brown, 
and put them down upon his doorstep. Then Twinkleberry and the other little squirrels each made a low bow and said politely, Old Mr. Brown, will you favor us with permission to gather nuts upon your island? But Nutkin was excessively impertinent in his manners. He bobbed up and down like a little red cherry, singing, Riddle me, riddle me, rut tot tot, A little wee man in a red, red coat, A staff in his hand, and a stone in his throat. If you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a groat. Now, this riddle is as old as the hills. Mr. Brown paid no attention whatever to Nutkin. He shut his eyes obstinately and went to sleep. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts and sailed away home in the evening. But next morning they all came back again to Owl Island and Twinkleberry and the others brought a fine fat mole, and laid it on the stone in front of Old Brown's doorway, and said, Mr. Brown, will you favor us with your gracious permission to gather some more nuts? But Nutkin, who had no respect, began to dance up and down, tickling Old Mr. Brown with a nettle and singing. Old Mr. B., Riddle me re, hitty pity within the wall, hitty pity without the wall. If you touch hitty pity, hitty pity will bite you. Mr. Brown woke up suddenly and carried the mole to his house. He shut the door in Nutkin's face. Presently a little thread of blue smoke from a wood fire came up from the top of the tree and Nutkin peeped through the keyhole and sang. A houseful, a holeful, and you cannot gather a bowlful. The squirrels searched for nuts all over the island and filled their little sacks. But Nutkin gathered oak apples, yellow and scarlet, and sat upon a beech stump playing marbles and watching the door of old Mr. Brown. On the third day, the squirrels got up very early and went fishing. They caught seven fat minnows as a present for Old Brown. They paddled over the lake and landed under a crooked chestnut tree on Owl Island. Twinkleberry and six other little squirrels each carried a fat minnow, but Nutkin, who had no nice manners, brought no present at all. He ran in front, singing. The man in the wilderness said to me, How many strawberries grow in the sea? I answered him as I thought good, As many red herrings as grow in the wood. But old Mr. Brown took no interest in riddles, Not even when the answer was provided for him. On the fourth day the squirrels brought a present of six fat beetles which were as good as plums in plum pudding for Old Brown. Each beetle was wrapped up carefully in a dock leaf, fastened with a pine needle pin. But Nutkin sang as rudely as ever, Old Mr. B, riddle me re, flower of England, fruit of Spain, met together in a shower of rain, put in a bag tied round with a string, if you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a ring. Which was ridiculous of Nutkin, because he had not got any ring to give to Old Brown. The other squirrels hunted up and down the nut bushes, but Nutkin gathered Robin's pincushions off a briar bush and stuck them full of pin needle pins. On the fifth day, the squirrels brought a present of wild honey. It was so sweet and sticky that they licked their fingers as they put it down upon the stone. They had stolen it out of a bumblebee's nest, on the tippity top of the hill. But Nutkin skipped up and down singing, Hum-a-hum, buzz-buzz, 
Hammerbombas. As I went over Temple Tyne, I met a flock of bunny swine, some yellow necked, some yellow backed. They were the very bonniest swine that there went over Temple Tyne. Old Mr. Brown turned up his eyes in disgust at the impertinence of Nutkin, but he ate up the honey. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts, but Nutkin sat upon a big flat rock and played ninepins with a crab apple and green fir cones. On the sixth day, which was Saturday, the squirrels came again for the last time. They brought a new laid egg in a little rush basket as a last parting present for old Brown. But Nutkin ran in front, laughing and shouting. Humpty Dumpty lies in the back, with a white counterpane round his neck. Forty doctors and forty rights cannot put Humpty Dumpty to rights. Now, old Mr. Brown took an interest in eggs. He opened one eye and shut it again, but still he did not speak. Nutkin became more and more impertinent. Old Mr. B, Hickamore, Hackamore, on the king's kitchen door, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't drive Hickamore, Hackamore, off the king's kitchen door. Nutkin danced up and down like a sunbeam, but still Old Brown said nothing at all. Nutkin began again. Arthur O'Bower has broken his band. He comes roaring up the land. The King of Scots, with all his power, cannot turn Arthur off the bower. Nutkin made a roaring noise to sound like the wind, and took a running jump right onto the head of Old Brown. Then, all at once, there was a flutterment and a scufflement and a loud squeak. The other squirrels scuttled away into the bushes. When they came back very cautiously, peeping round the tree, there was old Brown sitting on his doorstep, quite still, with his eyes closed, as if nothing had happened. But Nutkin was in his waistcoat pocket. This looks like the end of the story, but it isn't. Old Brown carried Nutkin into his house and held him up by the tail, intending to skin him. But Nutkin pulled so very hard that his tail broke in two, and he dashed up the staircase and escaped out the attic window. And to this day, if you meet Nutkin up a tree and ask him a riddle, he will throw sticks at you and stamp his feet, and scold, and shout. Cuck, 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 cuck,